All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. And um, my name is Jerry Boyle. I'm chairman of um, the Board of Trustees of Agri Research. And uh, it's my great pleasure to invite you all for this evening's uh, webinar. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with the work that Agri Research does, we're an organization, first and foremost, that's funded by farmers. And uh, we exist in order to articulate the research and innovation needs of farmers and of course then uh, to pass on to farmers the research work and the advisory work that's uh, been done by organizations within Northern Ireland such as AFBI and Queen's University of Belfast and Ulster University at Coleraine and of course CAFRI and other organizations that have information to impart knowledge to farmers. So look, I don't have to tell any of you uh, that we've lived through a difficult summer um, after a dry May and June when things look very promising. Um, you know, we've lived with rain since and uh, it's particularly hampered silage making. The grass checks exercise, which is conducted of course by agri-research and I think provides a great source of information for farmers and grass growth has shown that grass quality has been poor throughout the year. At present, grass is just 15% dry matter with an AME of 11.1. Uh, growth has also been below the long-term average for most of the year. Uh, and while grass growth is good at present, if you add up all of the growth over the season on the grass check plots, um, it's about running at about 8.9 tonnes of dry matter per hectare compared to a 10-year average of um, about 9.6 or almost a tonne higher. Um, for, luckily, I suppose fertiliser prices have eased a bit. Purchase feed, unfortunately, continues uh, to be close to historical highs. And of course, the, the price for beef and lamb have deteriorated significantly. So the price cost ratios have moved against uh, the ruminant sectors. So uh, one of Agri Research missions, as I say, is to bring the best in research and in knowledge transfer to your attention. And we believe we have lined up three excellent speakers this evening to do that. And the purpose really is to brief beef farmers on the options that are available this autumn to deal with poor quality, quality silage in particular, and to identify the steps, the practical steps that can be taken to safeguard both animal health, health, and of course, to improve your farm business and bottom line. And that enable you to get through what will be uh, a, a difficult winter. I'm delighted to say we have three excellent speakers and I'm sure when you hear their presentations, that'll be very evident. Um, Nigel Gould will be speaking on behalf of uh, Caffrey, of course, a well-known beef and sheep advisor. Nigel will be followed by Francis Lively, who is a principal scientific officer uh, with AFBI and will be providing, uh, you know, critical research information. And finally, and very importantly, we'll have a perspective on animal health to be offered by veterinary surgeon David McKinstry. And before I, I ask Nigel to, to commence his talk, do you want to say anything about housekeeping, Jason? At this point? Okay, yeah, yeah, no problem. So just uh, very quickly, uh, you are automatically muted. Um, use the Q&A function and not the chat box to ask questions. And you can do that at any time during the, the, the this meetings this evenings. So you can uh, put those questions in at any time. Uh, any question that others ask you like, you can uh, put a thumbs up and upvote them. If you have issues, leaving and rejoining usually fixes them. The webinar will be recorded and will be on our uh, YouTube channel in the coming days. And also just to request that you complete the feedback survey, which will come up at the end of the webinar. Thanks, Jerry. Now, and before I ask Nigel to, to commence the, the evening's proceedings, just to remind you again, questions are really... Oh, I think we lost Jerry there. The important. We learn as much from questions as we do from the presentation very often, a function. And 
also, folks, um, we'll keep the questions until the end of David's presentation, if you don't mind. So, Nigel, over to yourself. And thank you again for participating this evening. You okay there, Nigel? Yeah. Um, yeah, my, my, or, my phone, or my video just isn't even coming up there. I have to, I think Jason has to maybe start that. We can see um, it. Oh, we can see it. All ah, right, right, that's perfect. Right, folks, listen, um, I just, uh, my name is Nigel Gould. I'm a Beef and Cheap Advisor with CAFRA based out of Enniskillen. And I'll speak to you for about 15 minutes or so on forward planning to reduce the impact of the wet weather we've been having and the carryover effects, I suppose, into the winter time. Um, next slide, please. So uh, we need to develop a strategy, or you need to develop a strategy for your own farm. Uh, you basically assess what you have in terms of feed supply and animal demand. So in terms of assess, at the moment you'd be, um, at, the, at the moment we're talking about grass availability and I suppose on farm at the moment there's a uh, variation in, uh, in the amount of grass on farm and maybe a variation in the utilization of that grass. So all I could say is that, you know, you need to assess what grass on farm, but also maybe don't uh, overestimate the amount that will actually be utilized. So try and be realistic as opposed to the utilization of that. And I think going forward, um, look, at we're obviously all looking for a bit of good weather, but we'll be hopeful that uh, we will get it and we will get the conditions going forward. But it's just a case of maybe have things ready and be thinking about things now. So as soon as uh, we do get a dry spell, you can, you're ready to hit the ground running as such. Um, whenever it comes to kind of winter feed stocks on farm, um, you need to calculate what we have. I'll be kind of going through this in the next couple of slides. Calculate what you have on farm in terms of quantity and quality, and then the animal numbers and categories. And it's important then to basically uh, you be prior prioritizing uh, the a certain quality silage to different categories of stock. And then within that, you basically need to find out kind of how, how much of a certain of each category of stock, whether or each category of silage, whether it's poor quality, um, um, uh, moderate quality, or um, good quality, and uh, then you're able to match that to type of stock, and you know if there's a particular group of stock, I suppose, that will be lacking. Um, and look, you you have a, a choice. The two main kind of options, uh, whenever it comes to if you do have a deficit, will be you, you can either increase your feed supply, and that'll probably involve maybe purchasing in uh, additional feed or you can reduce animal demand and that will be essentially by um, selling, selling stock or, or, or reducing, reducing demand in other, other ways. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just say it's quality. So in terms of, uh, so Francis uh, Lively is going to speak in more detail about silage quality, but um, for terms of uh, whenever you're trying to figure out how much is in the pit, um, and you'll see it in the next slide that the, the starting point is dry matter, so you need that for a starter. And again, as I was talking about, um, it's not only important to know exactly how much silage you have in total, but you need to know the different quality silages you have and how much of each of them, as it'll be kind of a targeted approach. Um, quality then of the silage obviously will determine concentrate requirement. So if you have a, a finishing stock, for example, you will be targeting good quality silage for them. And if you don't have that, you probably need to, to consider your options. Um, next slide, please. In terms of silage quali uh, quantity, um, look, at this is going to be, it's, it, it's a case of like these are always only, only going to be estimates and you need to basically get as, as accurate as you can for your own farm. So for this um, this case here, if you if um, you know a typical silage pit on the right hand side, what you're looking to or kind of a shape, you want to try and kind of split up your silage pit uh, into kind of different sections and just try and work out um, as close as you can uh, kind of the cubic meters of of that pit. Just be careful whenever it comes to during the way in other years. You'll, you know, if there happens to be kind of a bit of wastage at the front or on top and that just allow for that, you're better off um, to um, underestimate the amount in the pit rather than overestimate it. Um, in this particular example here, we have 975 meters cubed of silage. And whenever you go down to the table on the right hand side at the bottom, and this particular silage is 30% dry matter, and you're able to uh, see then that to convert the 975 meters cubed into fresh tons of silage, you use that conversion factor, factor 0 0.6, and 0 0.6 by 975 gives you 585 tons of fresh silage. 
Now, <clears throat> just to be careful, whenever you look down at the, you know, this this is fresh silage. So look at if, if you're looking down at the the table again, and you move on up uh, to the twenty percent. So say for example, you have uh, that silage in the pit, five hundred and eighty-five tons. Um, you know, or yeah, sorry. If you if you look actually back to the table, you move up to the twenty percent, and the the factor you're multiplying that by increases. So essentially, you're going to be increase or multiplying that by zero point seven seven, and so you're essentially going to have a higher amount of uh, total tonnage of silage in the pit. But essentially, you just need to be careful that that's essentially the extra is water. So that five eighty five tons of silage as a thirty percent dry matter will give you uh, one hundred and seventy five tons uh, dry matter. Um, total in the, in the pit, whereas a 20% uh, dry matter, that's only going to be 150 uh, um, tonnes. Um, next slide, please. So whenever, uh, so the top uh, left, you're working out the pits, the, as you move on down, you add in bales in there, silage bales, um, this particular example here has them in at 850 kilos. Um, speaking to different farmers, there is huge variation out there. Like one particular farmer I was talking to, had, uh, now, albeit it was different, uh, you know, first, second and third cut under different conditions as well, but he had bales made with the same baler between 750 or just under 750 kilos, right up to 950 kilos. And then hearing from someone else, they had maybe an average bale weight, uh, they, they, they weighed a few again, and it was about 950 kilos. So. Look, I know everyone's not going to be able to go out weighing bales, but just to be aware that there is huge variation out there and just be careful you don't overestimate what, what you actually have. In terms of, um, so whenever you calculate uh, in this particular example, it goes your 365 uh, tons in total, you want to see then where are you in terms of demand. So if you look over to the right hand side and you work out um, you know, you, for every different category of stock, and I suppose you, um, like ideally, everyone's going to be different in this uh, different types of stock. Even if you have sucker cows, I suppose the allocation here again, this is just an example. Um, you know, this particular example is based on you know that 30% uh, dry matter silage and a 650 kilo suckler cow. In in reality, my my own business development groups, we've got uh, suckler farmers in the groups that you could stretch from maybe an average cow weight of 620 to 630 kilos right up to maybe 750 kilos for some of those uh, people. So looking in this particular case here, if you're looking at that uh, at the bottom of that table, and you can see suckler dry, dry cows at a ton of silage per month, but in reality, um, you know, that's based on 30% dry matter silage and the 650 kilo cow. And if you move up to maybe 750 kilo cow and you go down to a 22% um, percent dry matter, you could be closer to 1.4, 1.5 uh, tons there. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, so just, you basically want to match um, match what, uh, what um, or essentially how much do you have and how much do you need? Um, in, in this particular example, you have 365 um, is what you, what you have, 435 is essentially what you need, the deficit is 70 tonnes, your two main options is to either uh, take in 70 tonnes or equivalent uh, of uh, 70 tonnes of silage or reduce your demand by possibly selling or, or, or otherwise. Um, so next uh, slide please. So your options for the spring cavern uh, circular herd, look at we've been talking about uh, um, trying to make sure you have enough silage, enough grass ahead of, uh, ahead of stock. But I suppose one of the main things while we need to kind of focus is that we keep uh, performance going, especially with the younger stock. The likes of younger stock are going to be the most efficient uh, feed conversion uh, efficiencies on the farm. And if you lose that, you're ne never really going to get it back uh, as they get older. So for the likes of um, the spring calf and sucklers, look at if they're still out of grass and you're able to keep them out of grass, so be it. But I suppose those uh, those calves will be competing with the cows for that uh, grass. And I suppose in you know, day one, maybe in the paddock, day two, even in the paddock, um, they'll have nice fresh grass on top, but then they'll be competing with the cows um, for the last um, the last couple of days on that. So yeah, look at a, a simple kind of, if you were able to, to do something, even like what uh, this picture show, is showing here, a simple kind of a creep gate attached to the end of uh, an ordinary gate that's essentially kept ajar, and it can be uh, used then to creep graze uh, 
calves ahead of ahead of cows. Look, there is other options to do with uh, electric fences, maybe raising them, and different people have had different success rates. And it's just a case of finding the probably least cost option that uh, that works for yourself. Um, in terms of uh, you know creep feed and concentrates, if that is an option to, to uh, just to keep uh, performance going there, and again, look at ideally, I suppose we'll be monitoring performance, so you'd have an idea of, of what's what's going on performance-wise. But when we're talking about creep feed and concentrates, I'm not talking about going in with uh, with uh, um, you know ad lib as such. I'm talking about two kilos of concentrates to supplement the grass. Um, you know, we're to, for the likes of um, native bred heifers, you'd be going less than that, and for muscle type bulls, um, you'd probably be going higher than that. In the case of, um, you know, if ground conditions are still uh, kind of tricky in that, and look at us, we'll we'll we're always talking, or the kind of theme of my talk is essentially kind of uh, targeting certain uh, stock for different things, and definitely those lighter stock are what will be targeted uh, towards uh, keeping out of grass and especially if you're going to be trying to avoid uh, i suppose if you're going to be putting uh, targeting smaller cattle towards that kind of heavy ground as well so look at the um, if it was a, an option to wean cattle you're essentially able to kind of split that group up into smaller cattle and bigger cattle the bigger cattle the cows can essentially be kept inside and um, they're going to be some of the cow, uh, some of the animals on the farm they're going to do the most damage and um, then the, the the calves can essentially be let back out if uh, if uh, conditions allow um, and look at indeed even if you were to um, in, a, in a couple of weeks time if things were to dry up um, you uh, and uh, ground conditions allowed you could essentially have uh, cows back out there and um, to kind of grazing down those uh, those uh, covers as those that you weren't forcing the, the calves to graze down. In terms of, um, you know, this time of year, I'm always talking about scanning. You want to scan your cows and uh, identify empties early. And, and uh, this time you'll have the option of, uh, of essentially um, moving them off if, if you need the silage for later on. And again, wheeling the store producers, look at again, you know, depending on what your system is, you could consider to, uh, or you could consider selling. Look, just be careful, any kind of options of selling or any kind of changes to what you normally do, you just need to be careful of cash flow for next year. You know, if, if it was a thing that it was that they were being sold in a few months time or, or next year, and you're used to cash flow being good at that particular time, just um, don't forget that and just be just allow for that as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, in terms of um, store cattle, then, you'll be essentially um, dividing these kind of a game of two halves as such. So essentially, you're finishing cattle. Um, look, at once you get into September time, the the it's it's always questionable on leaving them out and finishing uh, finishing them, depending on the situation. As opposed, different farms will vary, but uh, definitely we would be telling people to consider uh, housing these animals from September on, anyway. So they're probably the first uh, group of stock you'd be thinking about bringing in at the moment. And then look at you get any kind of later stock that are going to be held on and that aren't going to be finished, especially ones uh, that won't be finished until next uh, next year. Essentially, those are the ones that you'd be leaving out and uh, targeting um, grazing. Um, either, you know, in all, in all cases, look at if, you, if it was a case that, like as I was saying earlier on, if it was a case that if you have, um, if you're low on that good quality silage and still you have a lot of categories of stock that you could have uh, using that top quality silage, you need to consider is it a case that, look at if you're not going to have good quality silage in front of these finishing cattle, it is going to push up your meal bill. Is it a thing that you could you could consider maybe selling these and someone could pick these up that is that maybe has better quality silage, is able to finish them more economically and maybe um, has, uh, you know, access maybe to uh, to cheaper concentrates, et, et cetera. So look at it's something you need to um, you need to weigh up and you need to, you need to consider. Um, but look at it all in all, you need to do a beef budget on it. And again, it's very hard to know what way the market price will be or the concentrate price will be in a couple of months time or even further down the line but at the end of the day if you don't have some kind of uh, figure in your head or some kind of a break-even point in your head you have no you know where to work from um just next slide please so I've, I've kind of touched on this kind of throughout so you're you're basically targeting your best silage your most productive stock and I suppose the bottom of the line there is your dry cows so your least productive the easiest ones to explain. The finishing cattle, lactating cows and young growing cattle, not necessarily in that order, but that's the, the top quality silage needs to be targeted towards them. 
the lactating cows, I suppose, the likes what we were talking about, the spring calvers, um, possibly weaning those uh, um, cows. And again, uh, Francis Lively will speak a little bit more about uh, this uh, and a bit of the research uh, to do with early weaning of uh, cows as well. But look at the option there is to wean those early and you're suddenly dropping them from a lactating cow into a dry cow and you're reducing, I suppose any, all cows have a maintenance requirement, sort of a certain feed requirement or energy requirement just to keep themselves at the same weight. But obviously if you're producing milk, you're looking for a higher energy requirement and a higher feed requirement in total. So if you can take that uh, take that back and reduce that uh, that demand in that way, um, look at that, that's another option um, open to you instead of just a case of, of offloading stock as such. Um, next slide, please. So this this is the last slide, folks. And I suppose what we've been saying over the, the or what I've been saying over the last few slides is that we're just talking about what we have in terms of uh, silage now and assessment where we are in terms of stock numbers and that. But I suppose we just need to be careful and we don't take our eye off the ball for what will happen next spring. And we, you know, we have to be aware of, I suppose, what's happening on the ground at the moment uh, will affect essentially what grass availability we have next spring. We need to be careful that, uh, you know, essentially we're saying about, um, you know, we're, we're essentially if we, if we, if we are, if, it, if we are in a position that the weather picks up and we end up grazing out uh, later on into autumn time, we just need to be aware that, you know, the difference between uh, closing date or the difference between housing date uh, this year and last year, like if you're basically, if, if you do get a dry spell and you happen to be kind of grazing them uh, further on into the, the uh, winter time, the difference um, between the closing date between the, between this year and last year is going to the, or the difference already in, uh, in next spring from you getting cattle in there is going to be greater than that difference that you're getting this time of the year because essentially if you're moving into a colder period you're going to have less growth if there's less grass on the ground you're obviously going to have uh, maybe lower covers and maybe later a later spring whenever it comes to grazing next spring so it's just it's just a, a case of kind of weighing, weighing up your options and and depending on your own farm and your own own situation in terms of I suppose minimum minimize poaching is a given, and the theme is always about uh, the lighter stock, the heavier ground. Move of cattle on quicker if required. Look at we have um, I suppose I was telling I was talking about this back in July time, and we were kind of saying that look at if you have to move them on and you don't have to graze down enough, it's okay. We'll get in in this rotation or the next rotation. It'll be it'll be okay. We'll get them cleaned out. Look at that's not happening at the moment. So look at all we can do is to make the best of kind of a bad situation. We do need to try and get really heavy covers uh, grazed out. Look at next spring time, the first graze, and we do talk about kind of cleaning out kind of some dead grass and that. But essentially, we do want to kind of uh, if 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 at all possible without without damaging the ground. In terms of um, you know repairing damaged swords, look at again if possible, and they like, have uh, alleviate compaction there. In reality, you know you need to if you if you're doing any kind of uh, compaction alleviation, you need to have it done in good weather. Sometimes you can get it in a good dry September, but look at the chances of doing that now at this time of the year are probably slim, and. Um, but it's more, I have it in there for the more the point of view that, you know, maybe next spring you just need to be careful and still be aware that there was uh, a lot of tramping or, or maybe poaching that done at this time of year. And there could be some kind of surface compaction there as well. Um, just be cautious of maybe going in with a roller on that and you could be kind of maybe compounding the issue. And um, look at, again, the simplest way of uh, figuring it out is essentially going out with a spade, um, possibly even next spring, and uh, just seeing is there any kind of surface compaction there and then assess your options uh, uh, kind of going forward. In, ter in terms of, um, you know, if there was any do damage done to... Um, you know, if there's an open towards or, or the, you know, kind of tramping and gra grass kind of tramping that, the look at the, you're going past the window, we'll be talking about autumn receding really up until the end of August. So we're going to come past that window, but at the same time, if there is a kind of open towards and that, you need to kind of think possibly of, you know, is there a bit of remedial action, even a bit of DIY action to do it? Maybe, you know, even get a grass harrow and a bit of grass seed and try and uh, avoid, I suppose, that uh, the, the, the patch has been taken up by weeds, I suppose, but that's on a farm by farm basis. So, like, as I was talking about, kind of at the very start um, of this slide, I was saying about the length of the rest periods. Look at a rule of thumb was also about at least 120 days of rest period. Again, the, you know, it all depends. Like, I mean, I'm down in Fermanagh and South Throne, and there's a lot of people to be looking at me to be saying, you know, it would be five, six months, maybe plus, depending on, you know, what kind of swords you have and, and I suppose what... Uh, 
um, you know, the drainage capacity or the, the, the kind of heavy nature of, of swords as well. So look at folks, I'm kind of conscious of time, but I am um, the, the main, I suppose, the key point of, uh, to take home, I suppose, from this year is, uh, or from my presentation was, is to assess where you are at the moment in terms of uh, what do you have in terms of feed supply, animal demand, um, ba uh, try and uh, balance them, uh, the, the two of them essentially, and look at it as the case that uh, go in early. If you can go in early, you can, uh, you're in a better position, reduce stress on yourself and reduce uh, stress on the farm um, business in, in, in the long run. So listen, thanks, uh, thanks very much, much uh, for listening. Okay, thank you. Uh, Francis, do you want to go ahead? Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So this evening I'm just going to take a, a quick run through and maybe go into a little bit more detail than what Nigel mentioned on just some options for considering uh, how, how to manage in beef systems this, this autumn. To move on to the, to the first slide uh, and really just want to focus in on uh, the quality of autumn grass and what we can get from autumn grass. So uh, I'm sure everyone is familiar with the with this table uh, from uh, Grass Track and was published each week. And although at this stage of the year, grass quality traditionally does uh, drop, you know, quality does decline as the year progresses. The grass is still, uh, you know, it is still reasonable quality. The dry matter, yes, is, is low lower than what we'd like this time of the year, but protein and ME is uh, certainly lower than it would have been earlier in the year, but it's still not too not too bad. And if we compare it to actually some of the silages, there's a lot of silage that's been produced this year, maybe a month later than, than intended, and uh, maybe in talented conditions, and as equally could, could potentially be low dry matter as well. So actually, we shouldn't underestimate the value of this grass that's, that's sitting in fields. And if we can try to actually utilize it and graze it, we, we should we should take make, make every attempt to, to utilize it that we can. Some of the challenges with it will be getting the dry matter intake from, from the animals. And really, if we move on to the next slide, we can just see really in, the, in, 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 in this slide, just sort of the impact of uh, dry matter. As the year progresses, dry matter normally does decline early in the year. Uh, this year we had actually dry matters reported in grass target over 20%, but at, the, at present we're sitting about 15%. Looking to the future at, at sort of the weather forecast that we're, that we're getting and uh, the quality we'd expect is more likely to be in around that 14, 15%. And certainly at that stage, uh, it is a challenge to actually get the cattle to eat enough enough forage. So really what we'd be proposing sort of from now on is really utilizing young stock that maybe just don't have as high a, 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 a intake potential uh, or a, 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 a don't have as high a need to, to perform. So if you're thinking of animals such as say weanlands, uh, 250, 350 kilogram type animals, if we take an average example here of a 300 kilogram steer, uh, it, it should still be able to meet that intake of in around 40, 40 to 45 kilos of uh, price feed per day, provided the, the, the grass is uh, no supply, it's not, not an issue. And that would would give up to 0 0.6, 0 0.7 kilos per day. And what is is typical type of performance you'd want from that type of an animal. So uh, where, where there's potential to keep those animals out, Certainly it is worthwhile doing that and certainly trying to, to make uh, use of these animals to, to clean out swords that leave better quality swords for, for next year. In terms of energy, the energy content of the grass obviously influences the potential uh, performance and, and daily life weight gain of the animal as well. Were the swords that haven't been grazed for maybe six, seven, eight weeks because of the weather? The quality of those will obviously be be lower than uh, swords that have been able to be to be grazed and are maybe sitting at a at a at a, at a 30, 35 day uh, rotation. But certainly, where those other swords maybe heavy heavier covers, the quality might be down to to to, to in around ten or, or or below that. But again, going back to some of the quality of silage is made this year, that uh, th that material is still uh, there's still there's still they're still failing and trying to get that they're cleaned up and, and grazed. And certainly if you can graze it with young cattle, they're less likely to poach the land and to uh, and cleaning that land off, cleaning that sward off will be good to uh, improve the quality of the sward next year. Uh, so really, if you do want to go down that route, certainly I think autumn grass, there is potential for young livestock to get them out. Uh, 
do need to be careful, particularly in 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 all ground situations, but particularly the further west you go is probably the is probably worse in terms of poaching. So really take everything to avoid poaching, moving them regularly, uh, moving them regularly, day paddocks or or or, or fairly fre frequent moves means that they're getting uh, access to, to, to clean grass on, on a regular basis, and that'll improve the grass utilization and it'll improve the intake potential of the animals and it'll avoid poaching. Certainly the photograph on the bottom right, we don't want to get into that situation where cattle are, are poaching that for obviously that would be a, a, a complete disaster. But certainly if we can try to uh, to manage this or manage the cattle to uh, to, to clean this ward with, with minimal uh, poaching is what we're what we're going to try to should be trying to, to do. We move on to the next slide now. And really just this is some experience that we've had at AFPI. Uh, and this is a recent study where, where we actually overwintered some uh, cattle at, at grass. And in the study, we had about 24 small, small cattle around two, Renan sort of ranging from 250 to, to, to 300 kilos. And uh, they grazed out, uh, so some of them grazed out and some were in the house. And at that stage, whenever they were in, uh, there was actually very little performance. So, so if we looked, there was a similar rate at at weaning. Uh, it was actually it turned out to be a very dry autumn. Uh, it following a wet season, it was a it was a dry autumn, and we were able to keep them out uh, right up to after Christmas uh, before housing them. But actually. The cattle indoors and the cattle outdoors actually had a very similar performance. And uh, whenever we turn them out the next spring, they actually were identical performance. So it does show you that there is potential and there is quality in, uh, there, 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 there is a role to try to graze out, out towards, because number one, it will reduce the silage requirement. And if silage, if there's a deficit on the farm, certainly, and yet if there's a deficit on the farm and there's uh, grass available on the farm, it's certainly worthwhile trying to take that out, provided you don't damage the, the ground. So it will, by, by grazing that and extending the grazing season, it will reduce the silage requirement. It'll definitely improve the sward quality for, for, for next grazing, next spring. And uh, certainly if, if, if there is a deficit, it'll reduce the feed cost as well. But, you know, again, just, just be careful with, 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 with weather and ground conditions and, uh, you know, adopt a, a, a fairly, ideally a day, day paddock system to, to move the cattle to, prefer, to, to avoid poaching. We'll move to the next slide now. A question that's often asked is, how beneficial is it at feeding cattle at grass? And uh, we've had a number of studies at Hill Hillsborough, uh, some in challenging enough weather, uh, certainly study one was a challenging enough uh, year. Study two was uh, was a slightly better season, but in both seasons you can sort of see that there there's overall there's not there's limited benefit in feeding cattle at grass, uh, provided they're going in for a, a long finishing period. If they're they're heavy cattle and they're going in for a, a, a very short finishing period, yes, you could could introduce meal at grass, but if the ground conditions doesn't suit that. Uh, and uh, you're feeding cattle in, in a throck and they're and they're making a making a mess they're far better in the house what would be more ideal would be take the light cattle separate the light cattle that are going to require a longer finishing period and keep them out slightly longer uh, and graze around the sward uh, graze around the the, the the farm without without actually uh feeding meal to them and then put them into the house and and if they're onto the finishing system, you'll get some compensatory growth at that stage and put the meal in in the house rather than actually uh, gathering around the field, around trucks. And in terms of the heavier cattle, definitely I think the, those heavier stores at this stage will be starting to do more damage to the land and they would be better in the house. Again, going back to the their, their feed requirement, uh, those cattle, uh, you will struggle to get the intakes required to, to be doing, say, a kilo or, or over that. So those cattle would be getting getting leaner if they're kept outside because it's unlikely that the grass would fulfil their full uh, intake requirement for, 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 for live weight gain. So really housing those and putting them onto, onto the finishing, finishing diet would be would be better done sooner sooner than later. The other one to, to, to bear in mind, just off, off feeding and particularly outside uh, where anyone is practicing that, just be very uh, conscious of, of health and safety with, 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 with fe feeding cattle around throcks, particularly in, in the sort of weather that, that we have. Uh, so just be, be careful on that. So we move on to the next slide. And really, this is just once we do get the cattle housed, uh, what's the impact 
of feeding lower quality silage this, this, this autumn and this winter. And really, uh, there's some farms, while some farms have been able to uh, make good quality silage, it is predicted that there was a lot of delays uh, with weather conditions, both for first cut and indeed for uh, more, more recent cuts. Uh, cuts have been delayed uh, due, to, due to the weather. So really, it would be predicting that the silage quality on a lot of farms is going to be uh, lower than, th th than other years and than previous years, and certainly lower than people maybe, maybe intended to be. So no, no surprise really is the, the lower, there's lower quality silage, uh, there's going to be lower performance received from the animals, there's going to be lower intakes. Uh, in a lot of cases this, this this year, and particularly over the past probably uh, past probably six weeks, uh, there's been difficulty getting getting uh, grass uh, in, in, uh, harvested dry. So there's going to I'd be predict predicting that there'll be a lot of wet silages out there. And just while it's feeding cattle, it is important to recognise that uh, wet silage uh, animals. Uh, to, to, to maintain the, the performance, the target performance, you, you feed to a certain dry matter. And if you're feeding wet silage, you're going to have to feed a lot more of it. So the little table there just shows that with 20% silage, in what I suspect there'll be, there'll be silage is off that and probably lower than that, where it's been a direct cut and uh, maybe even re, maybe even cut during rain could be lower than that. And you know, the animals could be, store cattle could be needing 30 kilos, maybe finishing cattle up to 50 kilos of that type of silage, uh, whereas uh, silage that has been grass earlier in the season that was able to be harvested in good, good weather and maybe wilted for 24 hours could be up to 30 or over it. Uh, so there's a big difference in the in just the, the, the amount that the cattle will be eaten because of the dry matter. So it's important to take that in, into, into account and uh, make sure and have the silage analyzed to actually know what, what the dry matter is and what the quality is. Also around the quality side, it is important that uh, silages that, that have been delayed, not just by a few days, but maybe by a few weeks or, or a month or, or, or longer, those silages are likely to have a lower protein uh, content. And having a lower protein content will, uh, particularly on store cattle that, that maybe traditionally aren't getting as high a level of concentrate as others, uh, that could have a negative impact on, on performance. So it's really important just to get the silage analyzed, see what the protein, see what the energy and protein content is. And in some cases, uh, I'd be predicting that uh, a higher protein uh, ration may need to be offered to uh, ensure young, uh, to ensure cattle or, or meet their growth, growth potential. So really, the key thing really is, is just knowing the quality of your silage and then working out, uh, you know, formulating your ricin based on the on the quality of the, the, the ricin. And obviously at the start of the winter, we should sit down and, and do our best to calculate the potential margins that, that we're getting. Little table on the right hand side just gives an ex example of uh, where we've offered high and low quality silage to similar cattle at, at Hillsborough. Low quality silage with uh, two and a half or five kilos of, of concentrate. Uh, or high quality silage with uh, two and a half kilos of concentrate. And really you can see from that table uh, differences in intake. The lower quality silage will have a lower intake potential and the cattle will not eat as much of it. Uh, and that obviously will resu result in a lower live weight gain. And often silage with low, lower quality uh, will have a, a lower uh, kill out percentage if the cattle are not, are not being pushed on with concentrates. Do acknowledge concentrates again, as Jerry alluded to at the start, concentrate prices are still quite high. Uh, beef prices have, have, have fallen back substantially. So it is important to sit down and calculate just what uh, what margins may, may potentially be and just have, have a steer in that. I think it's also important to say that, you know, where silage, if you're in the situation where silage quality is, is extremely poor, uh, and certainly is is in in deep values in the, in the fifties. It is maybe even worthwhile considering. You know, is is finishing cattle this this autumn the, the right thing to be doing if uh, if the quality if the silage quality is poor, uh, and potentially set, selling uh, you know stores maybe maybe more viable. But basically, get the silage analysed. Sit down. Do do do. do Try to calculate the cost the best you can, and and go from there really. Before, uh, before you know, basically at any stage you could you could start to to do that really. The next slide then is just uh, focusing on weaning, and early weaning. So uh, basically, I know there's a, a lot of producers have had to suckler farms have had to wean cow has have had to house cows uh, early simply because of the the, the ground conditions, and. Uh, 
unfortunately with no research at AFPI, but a little study done recently in America, wean cows at either four or calves at either four months or seven months of age. And it's a very detailed study where they looked at detail at both the cow and the calf performance. And in that study where the calves were weaned, say at four months uh, or, or, or seven months, the cows were uh, managed in a in a fairly similar format, but they were they were fed according to a uh, body condition score, and really uh, to, to and one of the key things that came out was that the early weaning, weaning early, those cows maintained their body condition score. The the cows that maintained you know the calves on longer, uh, obviously they were producing milk, and that had an extra energy demand on the cow, and as a result, those cows burned off condition. So uh, by they came to say seven months of age, and what's very typical to to to, to housing uh, to, to weaning times in 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 this country, uh, the cows would have been burned down. So actually, they'd been low on body condition scores, and those cows then required a higher feed level to get them back on target for for calving the next next season. It's important to make sure that you do get them back on target and back to the ideal body condition score, as obviously that's going to have an in, impact on on uh, next year's fertility and indeed the the the, the uh, fatality of the of the calf that's born next next spring. So really, in in this study, the the, the early wean cows and maintained their body condition score and actually had a had a lower feed requirement. And just on the table, uh, you can see there I've, I've tried to uh, work out sort of make it make it relevant to to a situation in, in, in Northern Ireland and really just looking at the traditional wean system, those cows were receiving just about eight, just under eight kilos of, of, of rice dry matter per day, Saturday's dry matter per day. The early wean ones were just five. If you work that up into actually what it takes to feed a cow over the 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 the, the the winter period, and if we're looking at say a seven month winter from here through to say next March, uh, the traditionally weaned cow was going to eat uh, six and a half ton of silage. The early wean was four, just over four ton. So actually, by weaning early, uh, you could potentially save up to two ton of silage. And certainly, if silage is a challenge on the farm, it is something to to consider to to actually wean wean, wean the cows early, particularly on. In a situation where cows are in the house, cows and calves are in the house, it could be a case to actually get them weaned and get the calves back out, out to grass. On that, just in terms of the calf, the, in the study, they also looked at the calf performance. And on the next slide, uh, or sorry, on, uh, yeah, on the next slide, Gillian, uh, we can see just uh, in this, there was actually very limited uh, difference on calf performance. So over the lifetime of the study, the calves actually uh, almost gained back up to a similar rate. But so by 16 months uh, of age, there's only there's only uh, I think it was 17 kilos of difference in, in live weight. And uh, so actually, the the early wean cattle did uh, did almost get you know did, did get back on target in terms of uh, you know, making it applicable to to a Northern Ireland situation. If calves are in the house at this stage, you know, potentially if they were weaned, we could get them back out to grass and they could utilize that autumn grass and do less damage to to, to the ground. And if silage short, you know, if there's a shortage of silage on the farm, it could certainly be a, be a system to uh, clean up the sward and reduce the silage, uh, both for the calf and also for for the cow. I suppose in terms of economics, it's, it's you know what you know what what's the value if you if you lose seventeen kilos in live weight first two kilos of uh, two two kilos silage. Depending obviously on the, what 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 your salaries cost and what 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 your 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 life it costs, but I, I think it would almost balance out. If anything, I think actually you, you'd be better with uh, uh, two, two kilos of, or two two ton of salaries uh, requiring two ton less salaries per per cow. That uh, so I think that would be a more profitable system at this stage. So it's certainly a thought. It's not for everyone, but certainly it's a it's a thought to to uh, to, to maybe. Get get some sort of form of cattle back back out to grass in situations where, where they've had to be housed, uh, uh, particularly early, and where there is uh, high covers of grass available for for, for consuming. So just to summarise, uh, you know, don't underestimate the potential value of autumn grass for young stock, uh, and certainly by cleaning this grass out in the autumn, it will improve sward quality for for next season. Uh, in wet conditions, feeding cattle at pasture has really limited value and uh, it will obviously increase the, the amount of poaching on the land. So we certainly recommend housing uh, cattle earlier and commence finishing and use livestock for, for, uh, to graze out the pasture. 
uh, use early analysis to formulate their winter ration and uh, consider early weaning. But I think the key thing going forward is just to regularly monitor performance and assess the impact of, on the grazing platform. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Francis. Um, that's two, two excellent talks. I think you'll both agree. And I just want to remind you, I'm sure you'll have questions. We'll take questions after our final sp uh, speaker, David McKinstry. And remember to use the Q&A. For me so far, anyway, I think there is, there's key messages coming through. Um, first from Nigel, full of practical advice. Calculate your feed needs. And he did stress both quantity and quality. And I think also he gave very good advice to be conservative. In other, in other words, to underestimate the feed you have in the pit and maybe to overestimate the need. And then Francis, I think, really picked up on uh, the importance of quality, which I often think is, is, is an underestimated and underappreciated uh, uh, factor when looking at feed. And of course, he emphasized the importance of energy and protein. Incidentally, all the slides from this, from this evening's event will be available um, after the session on the Ag Research website, and that will enable you to do your own calculations, which, which uh, I think should be encouraged. So it's over now to our, our final speaker, uh, David McKinstry. David. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think it's fair to say that it has, has been a challenge in the year so far. Um, and, you know, as the back end of the year approaches, you know, we could be running into challenges whenever it comes to um, the health of our cattle as well. And so far, we have been hearing um, uh, a bit about uh, pasture management and grass quality. <clears throat> but I, I suppose I just wanted to remind everybody to keep an open mind. Um, if, if you have cattle that aren't pleasing you, that aren't thriving well, don't put it all down to... Uh, poor quality pasture or grass um, you know there are uh, animal health issues and, and diseases out there which can affect that um, so um, whenever it comes to uh, disease or animal health issues um, you can see from the diagram here that there's really it's a threefold interaction so you have your animal um, so for example what's the, what's its body condition score what's its immune status and what's its breed um, these things all um, can contribute. Um, then you have the environment. So that's where is the animal living? Um, is, it, is it in the house? What's the ventilation like? Is it out in the field? Is it tramping? Um, has it clean grass? And then you have the pathogen or the bugs. So that ranges anything from bacteria uh, to parasites to viruses. Um, okay, next slide. So um, this evening, I just want to go through um, a few uh, problems that you might see on farm, um, either so already or c coming into the back end here. So the first one is lungworm. And uh, we had a, a, a very dry, from the middle of May to the end of June, was very dry, followed by a wet, warm July. Um, sorry, up to the end of, end of June was dry and then into July and we had wet weather and warmer conditions. Um, and that was ideal for the development of lungworm. And in front of you there, there's a, a slide, and that just shows you what the adult lungworm looked like in the, the airways of the animal. So that's leading down into the lungs. And you can see now why, whenever an animal is affected with lungworm, why you get that hoozy cough, because the irritation from, from those worms causes the coughing. Okay, next slide. And the lungworm life cycle, um, it takes about four weeks to run, okay, and the adult uh, worms, they live in, in the airways, they cause the, the coughing, they can grow up to eight centimetres long, and um, uh, they lay eggs, the eggs are, are coughed up and then swallowed um, by, the, by the, the animal, and then those turn into larvae which are passed out into the faeces, and an individual animal um, can pass thousands of larvae in that four week cycle. And then those are ingested back in um, by the next animal um, <clears throat> and the cycle starts again. Okay. Liver fluke, uh, another um, 
health issue that we could well see a lot of this year. Uh, mild winters and wet summers contribute a lot to a uh, liver fluke. And um, as you can see there on the <clears throat> bottom left hand side of the screen, um, I have included the life cycle of the liver fluke. And in the animal, you have the, the adult fluke. Okay, so once the fluke gets to 12 weeks of age, <clears throat> it will start to, uh, it becomes an adult, it will start to lay eggs. The, the eggs are passed in the feces. They enter the, the, um, the, the mud snail, and then the, from the mud snail, they form cysts onto the, onto the grass, which the animal um, eats again. So the first thing to remember is that the mud snail is a very important part of that life cycle. Without the mud snail, um, you know, you won't have a, a liver fluke issue on the farm. So that's why um, whenever it comes to trying to minimize liver fluke on your farm, you try to keep animals off um, the, the wet places uh, as much as you can, or, you know, places like tramp gaps where there's lion, low lion water. Um, those are places where, where you, <coughs> you're going to get large amounts of, of fluke eggs. Um, just remember as well that whenever it comes to treatment of fluke, that we are starting to see resistance to some of the flucicides, especially in sheep. Um, and we need to be aware of that possibly happening in cattle as well. Um, uh, whenever it comes to product selection for treatment, that will depend on what your protocol is on, on the farm for, for um, parasite treatment coming into the back end. But just be aware that you may need to um, use a treatment a wee bit earlier this year than others. And the other thing is then, don't forget about APHIS online and being able to uh, look at the post-mortem results on there. So if you're killing cattle at the factory, um, each animal's liver gets inspected. And if they find um, if they find active fluke, it will say um, active fasciolysis uh, and against that animal. And if they find fluke damage, which we treated and killed, then it will just say um, uh, fluke damage. And in the bottom right-hand side of the screen there, that's the adult fluke taken from the bile duct of the liver. And you can see what um, size uh, these parasites are, about two centimeters long. Okay, next slide. Rumen fluke, um, again, uh, will, will be a problem where um, you have wet or flooded land. Um, the mud snail is, again, part of the life cycle. Um, uh, Rumen fluke, if it's severe enough, can cause scarring and ill thrift um, in young cattle. So just be aware of that. If you've if, if you've flicked, if you've flicked and wormed, um, if you've flicked and wormed your cattle or your animal, and you're still getting scarring and ill thrift, then think uh, think of rumen fluke. And if you're going to treat rumen fluke, you need to. Um, Use a drench, so that would be level fast diamond or zanal would be the treatments of choice. Okay, next slide. Okay, so <clears throat> um, the uh, another thing that we really need to be careful of, um, just with uh, soil contamination of our feed. Okay, so with the wet year, maybe soil being more exposed or coming in on um, inner silage, coming off tractor tires, coming in on our straw. Um, uh, and there are two or three main issues that can arise from soil contamination of our feed. So the first one would be the clostridial diseases. They are bacteria which survive in soil. So the main one that we would all think of whenever it comes to clostridial disease is black leg caused by clostridium chauvi. Um, and what happens is the, the bacteria um, produce spores. These spores are eaten by the animal. The spores go and live in the muscle. They lie dormant, they hibernate until such time as the animal um, gets muscle damage from maybe going up a crush or from coming into heat and animals jumping on it or you know, um, maybe getting a dunt from another beast. Um, and then whenever that happens, those spores are able to multiply and you'll get an animal where, you know, most likely the hind limb, but you can get it in the back or in the heart, and it'll feel like um, bubble wrap, that, that feeling below the, below the skin. And if you get these cases soon enough, at the very, very early stages, they can be saved, but 
Um, most like most normally we find them whenever it's it's too late. And remember, the clostridial vaccines are they are cheap vaccines. They don't cost much to do. The other clostridial disease would be Black's disease, um, and it will affect. It gives you an abscess in the liver. These cattle can't be can't normally be saved, um, and you will get more issues with that whenever you have fluke damage in the liver. So that's another one to think about. Then listeriosis or meningitis. Uh, listeria lives in the in the soil. Um, it's a, it, it is ingested and it can happen, especially whenever you have a young younger animal where you're getting tooth eruption, and the soil goes up through the the hole where the tooth is erupted, it gets into the nervous system, and then gives you um, listeriosis. And typical signs of listeriosis are circling and facial paralysis, so a drippy eyelid, a drip, maybe a drippy ear, and a tongue that hangs out. And if they if they get really severely affected before you before you catch them, then you'll end up with a an animal that just sort of stands in total stupor and um, with its tongue hanging out, and I can't can't eat, and I can't see you. And those animals um, normally don't make it. So it's prompt treatment um, for to try and save those animals with, and normally with maybe angiomycin and new floor or or pen strap. Um, and uh, to help prevent that, try and keep your silage face as tidy as possible. Okay, once once the air gets into your silage face. Uh, if it hits the, the listeria bug in, in your silage, then the listeria will multiply um, and then you'll end up uh, getting more problems. Okay. And so I suppose, uh, like other years, um, pneumonia could be a problem this year as well, especially with the way uh, we've had to bring um, cattle in and out and in and out. Um, and maybe we haven't got a chance to get our, our vaccines into place. So as far as pneumonia is concerned, you have uh, several different agents. Okay, so you have the viruses, so PI3, which is a bit like the flu. You have RSV, which causes consolidation of the lungs. You have IBR, which is um, in the upper respiratory tract, and if you and BVD can also um, hamper the immune system. Then you have the bacteria, so Mannheimia, Pasteurella, Estophilus, and Mycoplasma. And Mycoplasma is one you maybe haven't heard too much of. It's on about 70% of our farms. Um, it's a difficult bug to treat. You need a good, strong, long-acting antibiotic for it. And then you have the parasites, uh, which like lungworm, and the lungworm causes irritation in the lungs, which then allows this, the secondary bacteria, like the pasteurella, to come down in and infect, infect the lungs. And clinical signs of pneumonia, um, I'm sure you'll all be aware of these, but uh, coughing, uh, weeping eyes, runny noses, breathing difficulties, or even maybe just an animal off its feed. Uh, an animal that is separated from the group uh, is maybe lying more uh, or has a tucked up appearance and it probably has heavy breathing and a high temperature. So these are just signs to, to look out for whenever it comes to pneumonia. So um, pneumonia prevention. Um, so... Uh, I suppose pneumonia prevention, there are quite a few um, parts to this uh, jigsaw. Um, I suppose trying to keep stress to a minimum is very important. Um, so uh, whenever an animal is stressed, it releases um, a small amount of uh, cortisol or steroid into its, um, uh, into its body. Uh, that steroid dampens the immune system for a, a 24 to 48 hour period, and that's long enough for those um, bugs to be able to um, get a hold of the animal. So trying to keep uh, weaning stress to a minimum, so using anti-suck devices or um, taking a two or three cows out of the batch at a time are all things that can help to minimize the stress of weaning. Making sure that your stocking density is right, so not overcrowding your sheds, making sure your parasite control is correct, so making so that's like um, treating for for lungworm, making sure you have your calves treated for lungworm um, a couple of weeks before housing. Um, Multi-source mixing. So if you're buying suck calves, buying in stores, you'll be buying most likely from uh, different sources. If you're doing that, you're bringing together um, bugs from different farms, and that can be um, can lead to a huge challenge on the animal. You want good hygiene, and you want. Uh, 
if possible, uh, good housing, housing and ventilation. And then obviously the other prevention is to increase the immunity of the animal and to increase the immunity vaccination uh, increases the animal's immunity to pneumonia. Okay. So whenever it comes to this time of the year, um, you, the main things you want to make sure you've considered is good ventilation in your housing, uh, trying to get your groups right, so group by age, um, group by size, and obviously with the, the cow-calf situation, that's very difficult to do because you have two animals that are um, they're different ages, they're different sizes, but they have to run um, in amongst each other. So the cows can actually harbor the bugs, and if they come under stress, they can then release the bugs, which the calves um, pick up. Um, so that is why in the, in the cow-calf situation, the vaccination of the calf um, can be important and making sure that you get your vaccinations into, into place in advance of housing, if at all possible. Okay. So uh, whenever it comes to vaccination, there are many different causes of pneumonia, as we've, as we've learned. There is no silver bullet vaccine, okay? Um, there's no, no vaccine that does everything. Um, you will need a farm specific uh, program. Uh, have a think whenever it comes to the type of vaccine that you're going to use. If you're um, if you're well prepared and you're able to get two injections in a month apart um, before housing, then um, that is a, a simple way of doing it. But if, if you're running close um, to housing or you've had to house um, sort of short notice, well, then you need to consider intranasal vaccine so that you have a, a cover within three or four days. You want to get, use the, you need to use the right vaccine at the right time, and it'll be part of your overall management program. Okay. And wormers, look, there are uh, enough wormers out there, a list the length of your arm, and I'm not here to tell you uh, you know, um, which wormer is better than the other. They all have um, their, their strong points. Uh, but just suffice to say that there are different types of ways of worming cattle. Okay, you can use porons, injectables, drenches. You can uh, inject behind the ear and you can use boluses, which release a bolus every uh, four weeks during the summer. And, um, you know, just depend on your situation. If you're using a poron, um, you know, I've seen in some instances this year where, you know, people have put a pour on on within 10 minutes, there's a cloud that's came around up over the hill and, the, you know, it has lashed on them and the, the pour on's just on, on the, uh, just been put on the animals. And that's not an ideal situation. If you're, if you were going to do that, you want to be able to have the, the opportunity to be able to stand the cattle in, um, in a shed for a few hours after applying the, the pour on. Remember about persistence of your wormers. Okay, so some there's different. They do last for different lengths of time. So some last for ten days. So the likes of Avamac Classic last for about ten days. Cytactin and Dactamax will last for approximately five weeks, and Cytactin LA will persist for um, three to four months. Okay, and but there are some where you have no persistence. So. Um, examples would be cortisol and chanaverm or the white drenches. You get, do get a one-off kill with these um, wormers, but you don't get any lasting activity. So the, so the animal can be in re reinfected with the worm um, the next day. Okay. Another problem uh, could be from poor quality or musty straw. Okay, so um, that can bring up a, a two or three different issues. The first one would be um, you know, bedding for calving pens, it is hard to bed with musty straw. It's hard to keep calving pens clean. Um, so, um, and that can lead on then to hard navels and scars. Um, and, you know, we may need to be looking at alternatives um, for bedding or calving pens. And secondly, then, the, the, the mycotoxins and the, and the must uh, um, can, can arise. It is sort of difficult to detect mycotoxins in, in beef cattle because you know, in a dairy cow, the milk will fall and, and she'll probably um, scar as well. Um, it's more difficult to, to detect it in beef cattle, but if you do run into an issue, there are binders available for, for mycotoxins to bind up mycotoxins. Okay. Um, for autumn calvers then, um, there are a couple of things just to remember. 
we're getting them back into calf. Uh, the energy um, requirement for fertility, remember that the first thing a cow uses her energy for is milk, followed by putting on condition, followed by growth. So your first calf and heifers are the ones that come under most pressure uh, needing uh, for, for energy deficits. And then they use the rest of the energy for, for getting pregnant. So if you have poor quality silages, then you do need to think about um, how much concentrate you're going to have to feed along with that to get the energy levels right for getting your autumn calvers back into calf. And also remember, minerals for fertility, iodine, copper, zinc, manganese, selenium, cobalt, are all um, minerals which have different um, activity whenever it comes to getting your cows back into calf. Uh, just a quick slide on scar prevention, and the reason for this is because uh, with the, you know, with autumn we're having, you know, if you're calving autumn cows, most people calving in the autumn because they want to be able to calve a grass and maybe even do without using uh, the scar vaccines. Um, it's out and cleaner, but with the, the the weather the way it has been, there'll be some people have maybe had to calve indoors, or the cows have been in and out and in and out. So um, just remember that you want to get um, two litres of colostrum into your calf as soon as possible. Um, if you've vaccinated your cow with rotavac corona, um, then, you know, it's, it's important the cow gets, the calf gets that cow's colostrum. Um, and look, it is hard to manage whenever your, your cows are in and out, but I think that's enough said on that uh, topic. Okay, Jason. Okay, uh, a slide then on feet and flies. Um, so, uh, the slide on the left, foul, remember it's a bacterial infection. Um, the bacteria is a, a fusobacterium. It actually lives in the dung. Um, it doesn't normally give you problems until um, you get skin lesions. So whenever we have wet conditions, you end up with getting skin lesions and you could end up with extra foul, especially if you're um, feeding cattle in around trucks and that and maybe getting damage. Um, and if you are experiencing a high instance of foul, then those are the things that um, you need to take a look at. Uh, the other one on the right then, of course, is summer mastitis. Um, a lot of flies still about. Um, and just a reminder that if you have dry cows, you do need to make sure you have a, a fly repellent um, uh, on them. Okay. And, you know, the last disease I'd like to talk about, real or condi health condition I'd like to talk about is, is grass tetany. Um, Grass tetany, I'm sure anybody with suck cows will know, know about it or have um, have that fear in the back of their head. It's caused by magnesium deficiency. Cows do require daily intake of magnesium. And that's so then we end up with problems whenever we uh, come into wet, cooler conditions with, with lush grass. So the, the lush grass is going through the cow and she can't get enough magnesium out of the grass. So then she ends up taking tetany or just simply if you have cows that are not getting enough grass and they're not getting enough magnesium. So it normally happens when they're sucking a calf and under under pressure. So make sure you supplement them either with meal um, or, or silage or magnesium buckets or, or boluses. Okay, so whenever it comes to prevention then, um, we go back to the, the, the slide with um, the, the threefold interaction um, of the animal, the bug, and the environment. Um, whenever it comes to the animal, you want to make sure the animal is well fed, has a good mineral status, and, and, and vaccinated where possible. Whenever it comes to the bugs, we need to be thinking about fly control, trying to minimize soil in the feed, and having our silo faces tidy, um, and remember about parasite control. And then whenever it comes to environment, a ventilation and dry, well bedded um, accommodation. Okay. Thank so, you. Thanks, sorry. David. Hello. Hello, yeah. Thanks, David. Uh, Jerry, Jerry Boyle here. Look, um, that was another really, really good talk. And uh, I think it very well complemented the the talks of Nigel and and Francis for, as far as I'm concerned I think one of the things they said at the very beginning I think is really really important to bear in mind you, you said that the lack of tribe won't be all down to fodder quality 
And uh, you, you, I think you provide a really valuable service for farmers out there and listening in this evening and viewing this in terms of the rundown of, of the disease risks. Um, uh, the, there's, there's a compendium there of, of issues that farmers need to be mindful of. And most importantly, of course, you also provided the really solid prevention advice. So very much appreciated. Just to remind you again, um, that we want your questions and please use the, the uh, Q&A function. Uh, I think there's plenty of material that has been provided there by our, our, our three excellent speakers. And I'm sure they've all prompted lots of questions. So I'm going to hand over to Jason now to, um, to monitor and to deal with the questions that have come up. Jason. Okay, that's grand. Thanks. So if I can ask um, Francis and Nigel to come back on again. Um, and Francis, I've got a question for you here. Um, at, what, uh, at what point does grass dry matter become limiting uh, towards dry matter intake in, in sucker cows or dry <clears throat> stock? Yeah, so good, good question. Uh, essentially, once you start getting below, you know, 14, you are starting to get limiting. Uh, I suppose what is the consequence of that? And obviously the consequence is obviously the cows mightn't get as much intake as what you would like. Now, if this is dry suckler cows or, or dry dairy cows, or, you know, that, that that's maybe a good body condition score. You could maybe accept a slightly lower, you know, a lower intake and let them mobilize a bit. But certainly if it's lactating cows, uh, it, it, it is more, more more of a challenge and, you know, you might need to go in and, and supplement or, or, or house them. But, uh, you know, in the situation where it's maybe some deferred grass, you know, it, it's, you know, and, and grass of a decent uh, cover, it should, you know, it should still be okay to, to, to sustain those sort of staler, staler cows. Okay, thank you. Moving on to you, Nigel. Um, there's a question here, uh, is if grass is too long, if grass is, is long, is strip grazing with a, a fencer a good idea and how much grass should you give with the, uh, in each kind of allocation with the strip fencer? Um, y yes, uh, just to make sure to use a back fence as well so they're not going back. Now, suppose we're, we're in a, no a normal rotation grazing system, we'd be talking about a three to four day allocation. So I'm assuming this person is, is maybe not, uh, they might have, uh, you know, a stocking uh, or a, a set stocking system. So look at, it's, it's literally, you know, as, as short of allocation, you're better off, get them in, get it grazed off and get get them out and you get the most uh, in terms of, uh, you know, with, with, without them tramping the ground and get the most off that, you know, okay. in terms of utilisation. Uh, David, a question for you. There was a, a um, Dennis O'Kane asked a question here. Yeah, you use an ivermectin based pour on on a suck calves four weeks ago, however, heavy rain fell to after this. Do you think he needs to do them again or would, they've got, would it have had enough time to absorb? He hasn't seen any coughing and they, they look okay so far. Yeah, it quite possibly could have had enough time to absorb. And if you haven't seen any coughing since, I would be quite reluctant to go again too quick with another another pour on. So I would leave it, you know, two, three weeks um, and just monitor the situation. Okay, thank you, David. Um, back to you, Francis. What was the um, diet and size quality of the house versus the January grazed cut? I'm not sure they grazed in January, yeah, but yeah. those extended ones. Yeah, so so essentially at, at that stage the the, the calves were, were grazed obviously for three or four months. Uh, it was obviously a mixture of of, of weather. So the, the the forage quality, you know, the the, for, the grass quality was relatively relatively good uh, in terms of you know the grass quality. It, it fluctuated a little bit week to week. It, it was I think at one stage it was down to eleven uh, percent dry matter, but it was generally in around fourteen to fifteen percent dry matter. The cattle in the house, uh, the, the comparison of cattle in the house were on average quality grass salary. It's about high, uh, it was about in the high 60s, it was average to borderline good, good quality salary. Both groups of calves got a kilo of meal, including the ones outside. Uh, and, you know, the performance was was almost a, a identical. So uh, it just shows you that the, 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 the grass quality, uh, what, you know, the grass quality, give similar level of performance to, to that sort of average average quality grass silage in, in indoors. 
Okay, then I'm not sure if this is for Nigel or for Francis, but should calves eight to nine months old be fed a small amount of concentrate this time of year just to increase dry matter intake due to grass quality being low? Nigel, do you want to? Yeah, I, I I would have said yes. The um, generally, you know, I'm assuming they're talking about uh, dairy bred calves as well. So I didn't just suppose if, uh, mention on them, but you'd be kind of thinking maybe one to one point five kilos for those for those cal calves at this stage. Okay, thank Same you. Idea. Then um, moving on to back to David again. Um, a question here from Stephen Lavery. If I vaccinate stock with IBR on the 1st of September and then we have a mild autumn and they aren't housed until the 1st of November, have I gone too early and will I have to ha uh, ha have as good a cover for stress at housing? Uh, no, I don't think uh, you'll have gone too early. Um, uh, up the nose, the, the vaccine will last for, for three months on young cattle and then depending on which vaccine he has used, but a lot of the ABR vaccines into the muscle will last for six months, um, so he should be he should be fine. Okay, and uh, I'm not sure if this is actually maybe for for David again or for 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 Nigel. I'll kind of leave it open to you. Any thoughts as to what you would look for in a good mineral iodine level, selenium percentage, etc. If there's any thoughts on that. Uh, well, I suppose my thought is, you know, we do have. Lots of good reputable feed companies making minerals um, here in Northern Ireland, and you know my advice would be to to go with one of the you know the reputable companies uh, that we have. Um, most mostly their minerals are fine, but there there are um, daily intakes um, levels which which you're trying to attain, and you would you basically would have to compare uh, the mineral that you would be it would be buying with with that. Um, you know daily intake that you, you would want but um so the answer is yes there are daily intakes that you want but you need to compare the mineral with with those and and you know some minerals we want to be fed at 50 grams a day some 70 grams a day so you know you need to take that all into consideration francis you're, you're doing something have you got a link there to that us study on the on, on the weaning there i don't uh have a link to it but i'll i'll get uh i'll i'll, I'll get the i'll get the the PDF of it, and we can circulate it afterwards. Okay, that's it. Well, listen, thank you all very much, Jerry. I'll hand back to you because I think that's all our questions now answered. Thanks, thanks, Jason. And um, I would just want to very briefly draw this evening's webinar to a conclusion. I guess one message that always jumps out in events like this uh, and, and given the challenges that we're, uh, as we look into the winter is to all farmers is to do your analysis. I think to assess your options, prepare a plan basically, a simple plan for the winter ahead. And I think it's fair to say that an hour or two spent on such an exercise will minimize stress for your animals, but also for yourselves. Look, um, one of the downsides of a virtual format, I think, is that we can't um, give the usual uh, Sorry, Jerry, we're losing you. Pause by way of commendation. I'd like to warmly thank Nigel, Francis from uh, AFI and David, our veterinary practitioner, and of course, also a farmer. And, um, and I would like to, to thank um, Jason Rankin, and Julian Hoy from AgriSearch. And of course, the audience here this evening uh, for your participation, your interest, and for your questions. And I'm delighted to say we had over, uh, we had a very large audience of over a hundred people. And so hopefully you got, you got benefit out of this evening's event. Um, finally, I just want to give a plug for a few forthcoming events. Um, Tomorrow evening, we have a similar seminar, seminar devoted to, to dairy. And indeed, some of you might be interested in that as well. Uh, there are other events, uh, Caffrey on-farm events that are, uh, will be important. We have an event, and Jason has put up the, the slide there with the details on healthy hooves and also on uh, soil nutrient, the soil nutrient health scheme. Um, and that's over a period of weeks in both cases. Um, we also have continuation of our webinar series that we jointly host with the 
the Ulster Farmers Union and AFPI, of course, on the theme of delivering science uh, onto farms. And um, uh, finally, just to give a plug for some forthcoming conferences that I think are worth noting. There's two in particular uh, that you might be interested in, or I hope you'd be interested in. One is the AFPI Soil Health Conference. And the other one, of course, is the inaugural Agri-Search Research and Innovation Needs Conference uh, to be held on the 28th of November. It's the first such event, and basically it's focusing on what farmers want from research and innovation. And we in Agri-Search think that's really important, that the research and innovation agenda, or at least a substantial part of it, has to be driven by the needs of farmers. Uh, finally, and uh, wish you uh, all well, is just to remind you to please complete the feedback survey it'll, as it will help us improve uh, future events. Thank you and good evening.